is the third year um, of this conference, and it's the second year that we at the Migration Policy Institute um, have uh, helped organize this conference. So I'm really thrilled to welcome back some regular participants as well as some new faces. It's been very interesting for us at MPI to watch how the social innovation ecosystem around refugee inclusion um, has blossomed and then matured in recent years. I'd like to think that this conference plays a really important role in that process in uh, creating some of these links and partnerships uh, between key groups who are working in this sector. I'm also very pleased that we benefit from deep and lasting synergies between civil society and government. Um, which I think the range of speakers um, throughout this conference really attests to and is also reflected in the generous support of the US mission to the European Union and the Canadian mission to the European Union and also the hosting um, of the, economic, uh, the European Economic and Social Committee um, today. Um, to that end, I'd like to begin by inviting representatives of the Canadian mission to the EU and the European Economic and Social Committee to say a few words of welcome. First, we're extremely honoured to have Special Envoy Stefan Dion. Uh, Mr. Dion is uh, Com Canada's ambassador to Germany as well as being the Prime Minister of Canada's Special Envoy to the European Union and we're extremely thrilled to have you with us, Mr. Dion. Merci beaucoup, Madame Benton. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I will uh, use the interpreting services. Uh, it's an honor to open such a conference. Uh, I'd like, of course, to proffer thanks uh, to all those who've uh, contributed uh, to this event taking place. Conference partners, including the United States Mission to the European Union, that co-founded the conference, the Migration Policy Institute Europe that organized the conference, and the European Economic and Social Committee that provided the venue and managed the conference registration. It has been a charm to work with you. Uh, the government of Canada is very pleased. I would also like to thank, to thank the speakers and panelists for sharing their expertise with us, and thank each of you for your presence and contribution. Uh, I would like to mention this, uh, especially uh, the Canadian participants to panels, including Doug Saunders, Dorota Luzinski, and Louisa Ebeltov. Um, I cannot insist enough about the crucial topic you will and we will all together uh, discuss uh, in this conference. Uh, that's key not only for each of our countries, but for the world. And maybe the best way to, to capsulate this issue is the way the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, framed it. He said, and he has been elected on that, he said, now diversity is a fact. Diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. And it is the right choice. La diversité est un fait. L'inclusion est un choix. Et c'est le choix juste. So we're talking about the right uh, choice. To say so, because then you have the political will, you have the philosophy. That's the, 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 the direction we need to take. But how? How to succeed? What policies should be implemented to make inclusion working? That depends to the expertise that you have. And this expertise is key for all our countries and for the world. I will give you only some stats to conclude my introductory remarks. My own country, Canada. In 1970, 2% of the Canadian population was non-European. 2%. 98% were from European background. In 1970. Today, 22% of the Canadian population, almost a quarter, is non-European. If you add the second generation, first and second generation of newcomers in Canada, 40% of the Canadian population. If you go in cities like Vancouver and Toronto, more than two-thirds of the population is first and second generation, and the visible minorities are the majority. And it works. And when you have the ratings about quality of life in the big metropolis of the world, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, always close to the podium. 
it works, but will it work in the future? Can we, can we take it for granted? Certainly no. And it's why we have the way to discuss between experts to see which policies should be implemented to make sure, I would frame it this way, to make sure that the third generations will be included, integrated, and not radicalized. That's the key point. The first generation come, the second generation access to the education system, and the third generation brings at home a boyfriend of our girl or, or, or a girlfriend of another community. And then the, the integration is done in a way that enriched the country from the uh, cultural um, universal aspects of all the newcomers. That, that's the, the goal that we have. We cannot miss it, otherwise it will be ugly. Instead, to have society that are inclusive, you will have society with mistrust, and it will affect our political life and our daily life. And we know that it's already happening. I mentioned Canada. Why I would not mention another country that has been key to organize this conference, the United States, of our neighbor of the South. In the United States, um, uh, non-white, non-white plus Hispanic people uh, constituted barely 10% of the U.S. population in 1950, 10%. In, nine, in 2014, they were 38%. Yeah, according to the census, the U.S. census, in 2044, they will be the majority. In less than a century, the profile, the, the visage of the American people completely changed. Is it a problem or is it an opportunity? I believe it's an opportunity for all these countries, including Canada and the United States, if it's well done, it depends a lot to your expertise and to the right philosophy that politicians and leaders should have under these circumstances. Last example, Sweden. Uh, at the beginning of, the, uh, beginning of this um, decade, 4% of the people of Sweden were Muslim. As we speak now, it's 8%. It doubled. And according to the Pew Institute, their middle-range scenario, not the highest one, Muslim people in, in, um, in Sweden in 2050 will be 20 percent, one out of five. So it took Sweden's months to find a government at the last election. A country that has a strong economy, almost no problem. The front runner at the last election received 22 percent of support and the extreme right 17 percent. Sweden need to find a way to integrate these people and to make them Swed Swedish as much, uh, as much as the others. Is the challenge for Sweden, for Canada, for the United States, for each of our countries. We need to succeed. It depends a lot of you. It's why I will stop right now. I will listen very carefully what you have to say, what advice you have to give. I'm sorry that I will have to leave for a while because I need to, give, to meet uh, Guy Farrestat to discuss many issues like Brexit. Brexit, by the way, we may speak about Brexit under these circumstances. But I will be back after and I will benefit a lot from your views that are so key for the sake of our societies. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Also, for your reminder that diversity is really a mainstream issue now. And for so much data that um, really researchers like us are put to shame. Thank you. Um, Next, I'd like to welcome Carlos Trindad. Uh, he is the president of the EESC Group on Immigration and Integration. He'll be speaking in Portuguese, so I'd just like to give you all a minute just to put your headsets on, um, if that's okay. <laughs> so, welcome once again to the Economic and Social Committee. The ambassador uh, has had to leave. Um, it was... Oh, he is here still. Um, um, it was an honor to hear from him. Uh, uh, his presentation uh, focused on a number of very topical issues, in particular the question of um, refugees, migrants, and the extreme right, uh, very relevant here in Europe. Uh, so you referred to uh, the extreme right and the populist uh, parties and the very uh, strong results that they uh, uh, earned in Sweden, for example. 
So uh, refugees, uh, uh, the issue of asylum, how to integrate migrants, these are matters of concern to us all, and they're going to have a big impact on the forthcoming European elections in May. So welcome to you, and also welcome, welcome to Megan Benton from the MPI, the Migration Policy Institute. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the Institute for working in partnership with our committee. Let me say something very briefly about the Economic and Social Committee. For those of you who are here for the first time, we are the home of civil society. That's what we like to call ourselves. We're the European Union's uh, uh, consultative body for the Commission, the Parliament, uh, and the Council. We are made up of three sections, three groups. We have representatives of the employers, representatives of the trade unions, and uh, representatives of other civil society interest groups, for example, NGOs. So it's a three-party structure, if you like, and our main task is to issue uh, opinions about uh, topical um, issues that affect the European Union. We can also issue our own initiative opinions, and we are, if you like, a link uh, between European legislation and policies and the economic and social conditions on the ground in our member states. Today's meeting is uh, being organized in conjunction with the IMI. The IMI is one of the bodies that we have to deal with specific issues. The IMI deals with uh, uh, immigration and integration. The group is made up of 15 members. Some of them are here with us today. Again, it's a three-party um, composition, and the task of the uh, IMI is to monitor and react on matters relating to immigration and integration. Today we're going to be discussing immigration. And I'd like to raise three examples, three recent examples, which show what uh, the committee has been doing on matters relating to immigration and integration. Uh, uh, these are very recent examples. They go back just a couple of months. Uh, very recently, the committee issued an opinion on the cost of non-migration and non-integration, uh, uh, looking ahead to the future. And in this opinion, uh, we uh, uh, submit, submitted this opinion to the three institutions and to our partners in civil society. And in this opinion, we say that uh, the best way of migrants, uh, people coming here to work, contributing to our society, the best way of avoiding political, economic and cultural and social problems in the future is to ensure that they are integrated through public policies to address the concerns in the host society, but also uh, that address the concerns and the needs of the migrants themselves. So it's a, a two-pronged approach, the concerns of the host society and uh, the needs of uh, the migrants. We need to adopt this uh, two-pronged approach. This is the best way, in our view, of uh, en en ensuring that we prevent uh, 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 the spread of racism and populism. So we need uh, specific policies to help specific groups, in particular refugees. So that's the um, uh, general uh, overview, but we also need to have a, a specific approach. We need to focus in particular on policies adopted by uh, local authorities and local communities. At that level, it's, it's easier to have a more personalized approach, a more personal approach uh, and that makes those policies more effective. And in our opinion, we say that there isn't one single model, uh, a one-size-fits-all model for integration. The models have to be tailored to the host society and their needs, to the needs of migrants. And uh, human, beers, human beings have to be at the center. They have to be the focal point. Uh, 
uh, so uh, we need to avoid a stereotypes if we are to promote integration. We adopted another opinion recently, and this relates to the integration of refugees. Now, in this opinion, we ask uh, civil society, um, NGOs, the employers, uh, the unions, and citizens in general, and also businesses, in particular small businesses, uh, we ask all those parties to give all possible support to migrants. We're talking about people who have left their, their homes, their home countries, and they are the most vulnerable. Uh, so in that opinion on refugees, we call on society at large to get involved in welcoming and hosting refugees. And we think that integration is a two-way process. Uh, social uh, media, social communication, um, NGOs, uh, local authorities, the trade unions, the employers, um, representatives, all those parties have a very important part to play and they're not excluded from this process. Everybody has a part to play in uh, contributing towards integration. So this is the appeal that uh, we have launched in the committee. At times of uh, economic difficulty, and, and we're still in uh, a difficult economic situation, we still haven't seen the back of the crisis, we still haven't reached uh, cruising speed, and we're all very aware of uh, the signals coming from the IMF, for example, the World Bank, the European Central Bank, saying that there is a risk of uh, another crisis. So against that backdrop of uncertainty, we need to make sure that our policies, uh, government policies designed to uh, help migrants, uh, well, we need to make sure that those policies continue uh, to be pursued. The best way of combating uh, xenophobia and racism is to make sure that our host uh, societies have a strong community. Um, uh, host communities have to be strong communities as well. So there has to be a two-way process. We need to continue showing solidarity and we need to continue giving our support to refugees and migrants. But we need to remember that at home, in our home communities, we also have problems with poverty. And uh, government policy, uh, public policies need to take into account the interests of both of those target publics. Uh, otherwise, we're going to uh, fuel uh, populism, racism. They will um, exploit um, uh, local communities and turn them against migrants. So. There has to be a two-way process. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you just give solidarity to migrants and you don't have the same approach to uh, the nationals of the host country, you're going to uh, end up creating space, room for racism and xenophobia and right-wing policy to uh, become uh, acceptable and turn people against migrants. Uh, finally, uh, recently the committee also uh, 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 examined uh, the European pillar on social rights uh, recently adopted by the Parliament and the Council. This is a very important tool in making sure that uh, social rights in our communities, in our societies, uh, are stabilized, are consolidated. As we say in our opinion, we're very concerned that these social rights don't pay sufficient, sufficient attention to migrants and refugees. The Commission communication does not refer to the specificities of those two communities, and that is the main message that we uh, presented in that uh, opinion. As I was saying, I've nearly finished, I've nearly finished. I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. The EESC is always open 
to this kind of uh, events. Uh, you know this, uh, the Institute uh, knows this, and I'd like to wish you all the best for your work. So let's get down to business. Thank you very much, Mr. Trindad, for those wonderful remarks um, and the emphasis on a, a whole of society uh, response to these uh, challenges, which I think is a really important lesson and one that we should take forward. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay. thank you, both of you. you uh, <laughs> I'm going to stay put. Um, we're going to have a little exchange. I mean, who would want to leave this ridiculous chair? <laughs> so I'm going to ask um, panelists for the first session to, to come up and join me uh, right now. So I'm very pleased that we almost have all of you on stage. I'm very pleased to welcome Anila Noor, who's Policy Advisor for Integration at the City of Amsterdam and a board member of the European Migrant Advisory Board. Fuad Mohammed uh, is the founder of Ashley Community welcome. Housing in the UK, which provides housing to refugees. Tariq Tari? Yes, hi. You're Tariq probably, aren't you? Not Tariq. Well, you which could, is, you, you, I'm, my apologies. Well, it's okay. Tariq is, is, Tariq. is okay. actually the... Oh, all right, well. Speaking of integration, right? Thank you. <laughs> is Director of Refugee Social Services um, at Jewish Family Services in the US. And he's also a documentary um, photographer. Um, and then Doug Saunders is a journalist for the Globe and Mail um, in Canada and author of several books, including Arrival City and most recently Maximum Canada, Why 35 Million uh, Canadians Are Not Enough. So the goal of this um, opening plenary session is really to set the tone and set out some framing questions for the conference as a whole. So I wanted to start by just making one or two points that I hope we can pick up um, during the next two days. Um, just to explain a little bit about this theme that we chose, a sense of home, the uh, framing of this is both to consider the immense challenges that can be created by finding stable and affordable housing for refugees, but also to capture the idea that um, where you live is so much more than just a roof over your heads. Um, housing is one of the most um, significant issues um, concerning newly arrived immigrants and refugees, um, as well as receiving communities and governments. But it's often overlooked or, or somewhat sidelined, I think in part because it's so much easier to measure employment or education indicators. Um, and these have perhaps an, a more direct impact on public spending. Um, but housing is really a major milestone in um, immigrant and especially refugee journeys. It defines not just where you live and the kind of internal aspects of how you create a safe space for you and your family. It also defi defines all external aspects of your life from who you'll meet um, to your job prospects, to your access to services, education and training. Uh, and properly realized, um, it means that receiving communities and newcomers are, are building a sense of home together, as we just heard, this importance of, of receiving communities. Um, uh, uh, when it goes wrong, it can mean chaos, bottlenecks for governments and service providers, um, alienation, even depression or social exclusion for families or individuals and frustration or even backlash um, from the local community. Um, which brings me to my second point. I think because housing uh, connects to a sort of constellation of different challenges, it isn't something that one social enterprise, one tech entrepreneur uh, can solve together, um, but it requires concerted efforts and partnerships across the whole of government and the whole of society, which of course sets up major constraints for social innovators in the sense that it's hard to solve problems that are structural and systemic and not always even related that directly to immigration and, uh, and refugee issues, but are in a sense broader social challenges. So I'd like to return to some of these themes throughout the conference, but first of all, I wanted to ask our esteemed panelists to um, reflect on what they see as the big opportunities and challenges when it comes to this defining of a sense of home. So I'm gonna start with Anila. What does a sense of home mean to you? Um, yes, uh, I will talk about refugee, being a refugee. I think uh, I totally agree as you started but I really want to ask you, everyone, just think what home means to you. Just close your eyes and think about home. And I can, you know, say it for sure. You will think about the home where you feel comfortable, where you feel respectful, and you feel some kind of affiliation. And so far, in these two or three, three day, uh, years, I have met so many refugees 
around Europe. They are missing this thing when they are leaving their home where they are living for years and years where they are born. They are living because those homes are becoming dangerous to them. They are not feeling safe. They are not feeling comfortable. They have threat of their lives. They have conflict there. That's why they're living. And they are coming to uh, new societies. And these host societies are somehow, I'm really feeling sorry to say this, they are not feeling uh, respectful towards them. All policies so far in Europe has some kind of uh, fear of unknown. And they have uh, this uh, crisis of the need this policy has like, shown they need to manage them. This crisis, they need to manage them. They don't look to these refugees who are coming there in their society. They don't look at them as a human being. They look at them as a crisis. So the human element is still missing. And uh, recently, our board conducted a survey in uh, seven countries of Europe, more than uh, f uh, 500 newcomers, migrant and refugee. And they all are saying this similar reflection. They all should, should say in this kind of experience. They don't feel respectful. They don't feel uh, part of the society. The houses they are allotted, they are far, far away from the uh, cities. They don't have uh, access to right of trans uh, transportation. And there are so many basic facilities are missing. And in, uh, as you become uh, like a refugee, you stay a longer period in the uh, asylum centers where uh, all problems are there. So f coming out from a problem, they're again coming into a new problem. So these kind of things are happening, and we need to really uh, think more about uh, integration is like not only language. Integration is not about only getting house. It's about feeling at home. When they feel at home, it's still missing, and we really think about it. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for those wonderful opening remarks. That really uh, sets the tone for the session. I really like the phrase, a uh, respect and affiliation. Um, uh, and, and also you pointed uh, very clearly to the challenge of housing being detached, separated from important services, infrastructure opportunities, which I think segues nicely onto um, Fuad, who is going to talk a little bit about the Ashley community housing model and how you can't just think about housing alone, but you have to think about the broader services um, that it's connected to. Yes, uh, I am Fuad Mohammed. Uh, I'm from UK. Um, so I came to United Kingdom somewhat 22 years ago um, as a refugee that cannot speak any English. Uh, I just really want to reiterate that refugee is somebody that left their home country and running off persecution. It, there's a big difference between refugee and migrants, and I'm yeah. sure you all understand that. So when I came to UK 20 years ago, uh, starting with the home you've just described, um, I had two groups of people. One group of people treated me as the vulnerable refugee who are caring and want to help. And the other group of people treated me as the person that's coming to UK to take our resources. So there's the two end of the spectrum. What both have failed to see me is the refugee who have got talent, skills, and aspirations, who wants to contribute to UK. Um, so whilst I was very grateful in coming to UK and very appreciative of what the United Kingdom have done for me, I felt the way that the resettlement and integration have been done when I came to UK wasn't the right way to do it. So 10, 11 years ago, um, I, I started with my colleagues, Ashley Community Housing, with, which is an organization that uh, started uh, what we call a five-stage innovative model of integration with the house. So uh, most of the people that we work with uh, have just been kicked out of what's called as NASA accommodation, which is where they stay when they are asylum seeker. And when they come out, they only usually have 20 days to get welfare, to get house. So the house that we give, which is a supportive housing, gives them that sense of stability. Um, we have a number of ways that we can interact with them, with supported, uh, support workers, housing officers, who are delivering culturally sensitive support services. So when we give the house uh, in our integration model, we also give um, help with the mental health, uh, help with orientation, help with language, and we call that support services. So housing plus support services, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we call resettlement. It does not integrate. It does not give the full integration. Um, in fact, in my opinion, giving just a house and a little bit of support services warehouses refugees. And a lot of housing organizations who just focus on just purely giving a house 
and some simple services will give them a sense of stability. But if we want to integrate refugees, we need to think about how we can give them the skills necessary to integrate them into the society and, more importantly, into the economy. And so we have further work, uh, which we, we do with our clients, which is either helping them to be ready for the marketplace or helping them to be ready to start their own businesses. And when they are fully integrated into the economy, we believe that they are ready to move on. My final point before I uh, pass back to Megan is that we have had a lot of challenges with the clients that we work with, even when we made them ready for the economy. It is that the people who are sitting on the other side of the table, so-called HR directors, managers from the private sector, is still have failed to see refugees, people who have talents, the future workforce of the economy of Britain. People have still seen refugees only in the charitable and the humanitarian context. And until we change that, giving housing alone will not do the full integration. Thank you so much for really drawing attention to the need for holistic support, but also a holistic approach that isn't just thinking about this problem in a, a narrow way. Um, I'm going to turn next to Tarek. Uh, how are some of these challenges that we've heard about in um, Europe different in the Midwest? And how does this question of where housing is and how it connects to oppor op economic opportunities arise uh, in your work? Um, so I'm going to give um, a, a quick of a background on what success looks like, and integration looks like, in a small town or a small city uh, called Columbus, Ohio. Um, for the past 16 years, I have been helping refugees integrate through economically, politically, and uh, definitely socially. And part of that integration, what led to not only me, but many other colleagues, uh, 873 businesses are operating um, by refugees and so you're looking at that alone and this is we're not looking at the entire state we're looking at Columbus Ohio it's the capital city um, uh, that's the number of businesses that have been operated also the the average median um, income that earned is 42,000 are annually compared to the American born which is about 51,000 so that's not a whole lot of gap between the refugees who, I'm not talking about the refugees who've just been resettled, I'm talking about refugees who've been in the country for over seven to eight years. Um, and the purchasing power uh, for, the, for the refugee community is 35.9 million annually. So that's the amount of money they put in into the economy to circulate. The taxes they pay to Franklin County, that's the county that Columbus, Ohio, is $1.6 billion. So when you talk about success and integration, those are the numbers that are facts and those numbers that talk, and that is what refugees can do to a community when they come in. And as Fuad mentioned, is when you get them integrated, they really build um, economically and politically uh, into a city and make it vibrant. So as also my colleagues are talking about here, it is not a charity. I don't focus, we don't focus on, you know, sure, the refugees have shared tremendous amount of um, life that many of us hope never face. Uh, but that's not the only story. The story is engineers, lawyers, people who are artists, people who are, have done many wonderful things in their home country, and how can those skills be transferable to a marketplace economy in which uh, they can compete with with uh, with the local community and also be part of that discussion uh, when it's necessary. Thank you. Thanks very much for pointing to the transformative economic potential, particularly in these um, smaller cities and rural areas. Um, uh, finally, Doug um, um, is going to, I think, offer some solutions to some of these issues and talk about so these problems. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the uh, beauty of coming last. <laughs> Um, and talk about things from an urban planning perspective. Yeah, let me um, let me back up. Let me, let me try to synthesize what we've heard from my colleagues here. And I think I think the most important lesson from an urban perspective is we need to stop thinking about 
refugees as people who we need to integrate. Um, I think there's a perspective from people, you know, who look like me often, that these are the desperate who've arrived on our shores, and, and if we don't uh, enact policies to cause them to be like us, uh, they will be a threat to us. And, and uh, we, I, we need to have a different way of thinking about this. I've never heard of a policy of integration that, that has succeeded. You can't integrate people from above. People, and whether they're coming from conflict or for, for economic reasons, they integrate themselves. They, they know the pathway to inclusion in the economy, to inclusion in the educational system. And I should say, once economic inclusion and educational inclusion are achieved, once, they've, once people have, families have reached the same level as the average population, the cultural stuff tends to take care of itself. Um, so people are seeking, coming to your country, they're seeking a pathway to inclusion, and, and they will find it unless there are barriers placed in their way, unless there are obstacles to their pathway to self-inclusion. And this is where housing and urban design and urban planning become very important, because a lot of the barriers to inclusion uh, uh, are, exist in physical form. Even things that we think of as economic, lim economic barriers and uh, institutional obstacles and political obstacles often manifest themselves in spatial form. You can see in the neighborhoods, there's no place to set up your small business. There's no place to, to, to become part of the political community and so on. And these can be addressed through interventions. I've, been, I've, done, I've done a lot of work in recent years with World Bank and the IOM, and, and I'm just starting some work with the Bosch Foundation uh, to try to identify how to remove obstacles to refugee self-integration uh, in, in cities. I think the first thing we need to recognize is there should be no such thing as refugee housing. Um, there should not be refugees who are in a place that's just refugees, except for the very limited instance of immediate emergency shelter, of course. But you need to move refugees, first of all, physically into places where they can engage with the regular economy, with the regular culture and population. But second of all, you need to eliminate their status as refugees as quickly as possible. Uh, countries that succeed in turning refugees into successful people are the ones that the most quickly remove their refugee status and turn them into regular immigrants, and then remove their immigrant status and give them a pathway to full legal citizenship. Um, that, that itself, that, that quick pathway, takes care of a lot of the problems. Now let's just, let me just finish by, by talking about where, what, what, where refugees live, what's, where refugees want to be housed, and what works best for them. Um, people who are refugees are not the, 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 the destitute of the world spilling out of the countries they come from. They tend, any, anybody who can manage an international move even a resettlement move, uh, tend to be people who are coming with skills and knowledge and, and propensities. They much more often tend to be not units of labor who are competing with domestic units of labor, but people who create economies and create jobs. I was very pleased to hear from my colleagues this emphasis on small business creation and so on. These are people who are used to being employers, not to being employees. Um, and if you talk to refugee communities, about where they want to live, there's three things that people always say that they seek. First of all are known economic opportunities, places where they know they can find work or they know that it would be possible to start a small business doing the thing that you were doing before or buying and selling something that you know. Second of all, a place where there are people from the same background and language uh, and, and, uh, and culture, not just because it's comforting, because these are people who will loan you money, these are people who will help you with housing, these are people who will help you integrate. We need to recognize that people clustering together by ethnicity or language group or, or national background is not a sign of failure or a parallel society. It's the main instrument of self-integration. It's how people become part of the, the new culture they're in. And third of all, a place where housing is available in a way that they can afford, whether 
whether it's through a ownership process or through a rental process or through a social housing process. But I should note, of those three things, the thing that all refugees and immigrants will cross off the list first is the third one. People will very happily live and will ask to live where the housing is unaffordable. Um, one of the worst things that can happen to refugees is to be put somewhere where the housing is affordable. Because whatever makes the housing affordable is something that has met, means that there's no, eco no economy going on and there's no opportunities. And I've seen too many European countries, particularly during the last three or four years, during the crisis years of 2015 and 2016, take policy approaches where they say, we have a bunch of refugees, let's settle them in the places where there's freely available housing. Where, where the rent is extremely low, where maybe there's an old military base that uh, has empty houses and that sort of thing. That's a recipe for catastrophe. People cannot do the, the normal immigrant thing, which is to locate yourself somewhere that's close to a middle class neighborhood where you, where you can open a little shop or a little restaurant, maybe in the building that you live in, where there'll be middle class people walking past with money in their pocket to buy stuff at your shop, uh, where uh, where there's a pathway to being able to own the housing you live in so that you can use the rising value of your business and your housing to pay for the education of your children in advanced levels um, and to become part of the community around you. Um, if, you're, if you're warehousing people or putting them in housing that's isolated or has empty spaces between it or is unwanted by the domestic population, then you're creating, you're creating a, a serious barrier uh, to integration. So this is why it's very important that we're talking about housing and urban planning at this conference because the th stories we've heard about what people are seeking, that manifests itself in the physical form and in the choices of where people live and in the obstacles we place in the way of those choices. Thank you very much, Doug, um, especially for that uh, caution not to over-engineer integration policy, which perhaps we're um, sometimes all guilty of. Um, before I throw this out for questions, I just wanted to raise one point, which has kind of come through from everyone about, well, well, you phrased it nicely as self-integration, that really if refugees were to pick, they would pick places with economic opportunities. I mean, to play devil's advocate, policymakers in Europe are facing some really tough constraints on this issue. Um, the need to provide some kind of fair distribution of refugees uh, across the different regions, um, the need to provide safe and affordable housing, um, and just you know that primary goal of, of security and safety, it is not always possible to provide housing in places where there are economic opportunities, nor is it always desirable to let people house themselves, which can lead to other other issues like overcrowding or um, um, uh, very poor quality housing. Um, does anyone have a solution to this trade-off? And is it about this kind of job creation even when it is places which have housing but not jobs? Or is part of the solution secondary mobility and encouraging people to move on once they have already achieved this initial goal of safety and security for Ed? I think the solution lies with starting to assess the individual um, correctly. So if somebody is ready for the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the hotel industry, and there's a lot of hotels going on in the city, the person wants to move in, I think very quickly the person can be can acquire the skills necessary to get into uh, employment and then get private uh, property just like you and me. Um, it, this is where we need to march the skills of the refugee to where we are housing them. What usually happens, especially in Great Britain, is that we just dump refugees into where we can find housing, which usually is where, as uh, Dak have explained very well, where there's no economic activity going on. So I think we should start with assessing and starting with the individual, what skills they have, where can they contribute, and marching them with the right, uh, uh, where, where, where there's the right um, employment uh, opportunities available. All right, uh, I am going to throw this open to questions then. Um, yes, please. If you'd like to just say um, who you are and who you work for, that would be very helpful. No, okay. 
Yes, thank you. And my name is Tarinka Tsishke. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology, carrying out research on shared housing uh, between refugees and, and native uh, populations for improving integration outcomes. So um, I thank you all the speakers. This is highly relevant and very innovative indeed. And I would like to launch a provocative, um, let's say, uh, devil's advocate question to Doug Sanders in particular. Um, I think people in this room, we all, all most of, all, of us, would share the wish to um, give housing to refugees in economically thriving areas, right? However, what would you say should be the argument that could uh, convince people uh, who feel threatened by uh, refugees bypassing year-long 10 year long sometimes waiting list to be in such housing, which is already scarce for local populations. And this is an issue that we have to deal with when proposing policies and, and, and practices in that, in that direction, a sense of reality. I think, uh, I mean, this is, this, is, this is the problem that we're wrestling with. But keep in mind this idea that, that you're going to be ha housing refugees or, 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 or having a policy, this is only during the first year or two that they're in the country in most places. There are European countries that treat people as refugees throughout a much longer period. Uh, then you get the problem, of course, of, of, of sort of a, a, a state-maintained ma policy where people remain refugees for a long period. But generally in countries where there, there is an effort to turn refugees into citizens and into part of the economy, the idea of finding them housing is something that happens during the first couple years. Um, and during that period, uh, refugees, uh, it, it's a different situation. Pe it, this, this, is, this is where refugees are different from other immigrants. This is where, because they are not coming with big, with as, as much advanced planning, as much saving, and as much resources as, as economic immigrants do, and, and they do need support. I mean, I have this experience personally, and of course in Canada, there's a few Canadians here. The largest group of, our, of refugees we take are family sponsored, which means that middle class Canadians all seem to have a refugee family who they are sponsoring, which means you are, your family is responsible for providing their housing and providing, you know, ensuring their employment and, and education access during their first year in the country. So a lot of us as citizens experience the problems that governments do in other countries. I, 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 share, I share sponsorship of a couple Syrian families and the effort to find them housing in one of the most expensive housing cities in North America has been a struggle for us, particularly the fact that uh, uh, they, need, they, are, they are not people who are going to be able to afford an automobile or anything like that during the first couple of years. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and particularly because it's a purely market housing area, um, and you find yourself making deals and, and hustles and compromises uh, in, order, in order to find them housing. You find yourself as an individual doing what governments have, uh, have to do. Um, and it needs to be a compromise. You, you're, you're not going to be able to get people access to fully subsidized social housing in the most desirable economic areas, but you also don't want to be uh, warehousing them in, in vacant areas. And you need to recognize that this form of housing during the first couple of years is a stepping stone that once they're settled uh, and included, ideally you want them to be in a situation where maybe they're going to move to another city, or maybe they're going to, maybe, maybe it will be desirable for them to move into a, a different part of the city where maybe they have to live several people to a room in order to be closer to the economic opportunities that, that they need. So we need to recognize that there's a difference between the initial settlement problems of housing and then the long-term housing goals for people of refugee background. Of this perception of queue jumping um, arise in the Netherlands and is there anything that governments can do about it, for instance, by increasing the supply of social housing for the whole population? Yes, um, because I am from Netherlands and Delft is Netherlands, so I'm familiar with the question you ask. And I think, uh, being a working with a refugee, I think I can understand uh, why natives are so feeling frustrated because they are waiting for 10 years, 11 years to get a social housing when Netherlands already is a small country and having this housing issue. But the thing is that they need to 
realize that the Lima, you know, the refugees are coming, they shouldn't feel as a threat to them, you know. And the thing is that we need to sit together, involve refugees in the policy making to know like what kind of policy we need to make. There's a distance, a lot of distance in policy making and in the implementations. And uh, I think housing could be self, uh, solved, as you say, uh, there should be some kind of sharing uh, departments and uh, sharing uh, apartments sh should be considered. And the thing is that we need to work towards uh, inclusion. In Netherlands, there is a system, they make pockets of migrants and refugees, and they have some kind of distance more with the natives. So this creates, again, exclusion, not inclusion. So I think we need to work to uh, think about how we can create living together. Yeah. Um, in, in the context of the U.S., I think the first five years to seven years, it's a lot easier for refugees to purchase homes, especially in suburbs. And uh, I'm not sure if that's Canada's also the similar, but I, I, but I imagine uh, it's much easier than Europe purchasing a home on a loan. Um, it was difficult for the Somali population at first because of the loan structure and Islamic loan uh, uh, disbursement. But for the Bhutanese, Nepali, the Congolese, and uh, the Burmese, um, I mean, they are fighting each other to move out of, out of where they are. And they're competing with each other to buy the home, and they're raising the prices for each other in order for them to be, to be successful. So it is uh, sometimes the, the effects also of, of moving out of your neighborhood and moving to a, um, a, a more suburb, it, it also has an effect. And, and uh, some of the neighbors are, are, I mean, Bhutanese Nepalis are well into gardening, and they, they will like to, you know, uh, they do their own gardening in the backyard. And, and some of the American folks are, they want their lawn to be pristine and clear, and there's a conflict right there. Some of the religious worshiping also is different. So there's a little bit of issues that we've seen, and we try to solve those. But I think for us Americans, much easier uh, for, for refugees to self-integrate and move out where they were. This is, this is a big discrepancy between the European model and the North American model. I mean, in, in Canada, and I think similar in the United States, close to half of refugees end up owning a house within five years of, of, uh, of not, not of arriving, but of receiving landed status. Uh, and, um, and that, that home ownership becomes a big pathway to integration because it's a piece of equity uh, that you own that you can then borrow against. Now, there are some real difficulties in the modern inflated housing markets, which is a lot of people from refugee backgrounds Yes, they actually have a surprisingly high rate of home ownership, but they're doing so by syndicating loans across enormous branches of their families and these sort of things. People end up in, in extraordinary ranges of, of debt. So there's a need to create better instruments uh, to allow people from refugee backgrounds. And I should say, I, I think a, a way around this housing problem of co competition is recognizing it. Any problem we recognize for refugees in access to housing market is a, also a problem that we would, should be recognizing for our own children's access to housing markets. If there are barriers to, uh, because of lack of housing supply, causing prices to go up, that's a problem for, for the next generation of domestic populations as well. And we can think of this the same way in terms of labor market access problems and so on, that, that it helps from a policy position to say, this is not a refugee problem, this is a next generation problem. And one subset of the next generation uh, happen to be refugees. But there are not enough instruments in housing policy in European cities to create a pathway from social housing to market housing to ownership, to allow people to purchase the housing, the housing unit that they're living in, and then to, to invest in it and to make it successful. It's worth learning from a lot of, some developed countries do it better. Mexico does better in terms of recognizing that all of its social housing is, is owned housing with special, uh, special mortgage instruments to allow low-income immigrants and internal migrants access to, to, to ownership. Because that is often the difference between if you look at countries where refugees do well, it, it is often because they're able to get a foot into the property market earlier than, than in other countries. Um, for, do you want to talk a little bit about the UK housing market, which I think is different again from, from the US and Europe and how that perception of queue jumping also arises there? Um, yes, there's 
we have this very similar to you, a very long waiting list. For example, in the city I came from, Bristol, there's about 10,000 families waiting for the first social housing unit which becomes available. Um, so that, the, so the, the, there's the feeling from the host community that while we've been waiting for this, why these people are queue jumping. So one of the things that we do, again, is to focus that not everybody I think we need to move away the concept that all refugees are vulnerable and thus need just to move into social housing. So, for example, speaking from our experience, for the people that we see, up to 40%, 45% have some sort of difficulties and health, physical, which would mean that they're vulnerable. But the, the vast majority are ready for the labor market as such that if we invest in giving them the necessary training, uh, necessary to help them either to move them into employment or self-employment, uh, as, as my colleagues have said earlier. A lot of them have been very successful entrepreneurs in their home country. Then there's nothing stopping them to move into the private sector. So the whole social housing should be seen as the first one year, six months, and up to some extent two years of just getting into uh, and developing your skills. But it's not a long-term strategy. So I think it, it, the challenge does exist in Bristol, um, but, but the solution should be to focus on giving the necessary skills to help refugees to move away from uh, these anyway, the private areas which holds them back. Thank you. Um, more questions, please, lovely audience. Yes, please, at the front. Uh, my name is Khalid Hamid Farooqi. I am a television newspaper reporter here based in Brussels, uh, covering issues in Europe for 14 years, particularly on refugees. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of experience. Uh, the impediment to integration, in fact, is public opinion. And right-wing uh, politics in Europe, particularly making it very hard uh, for people to accept refugee anymore. But uh, I had experience. I graduated from the Netherlands, and in Netherlands did a lot of things with good intentions. Clusterization of immigrants and refugees. I asked one, once the, the minister, why did you really put all immigrants and refugees on one cluster in one place? There are neighborhood, and this is sort of apartheid, so he got offended. He said because people really feel to live together, and the refugee want to live together. So this is also other side of the coin, and the, if uh, we work on public opinion, it is really politics and press making very, very hard. Most of journalists uh, are not really ready to understand the background of refugees, and uh, then they influence policies because refugee cannot reply the, them in newspapers and television, so there's a one-sided story against refugees going on and on. So if uh, on policy level, uh, some kind of influence can be wheeled in media, and media is very important, so we might be able to really uh, push integration more and more and faster. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to take this question, the resistance of public attitudes? Uh, I mean, I can, give an, I can give an example um, of when the refugees cluster themselves. There's uh, and about six or seven years ago, there was a neighborhood, um, unfortunately, called Luxury Lane, and it was not luxury at all. Um, it burned down. The neighborhood, half of the apartments burnt down, and we tried to move the refugees into a better neighborhood, and there was a lot of resistance. People did not want to go. This is where the shops are. This is where the mosques are. This is where their home, this is where they belong. And where we wanted to move those better apartments outside, uh, on the other side of the city, and they refused to do that. We just could not believe we have better place for you. We have better opportunities closer to the jobs. They said no. They chose to stay for three weeks in a Red Cross shelter to make sure that their apartments were being built again. So there's the, the self-imposed uh, in a bad neighborhood sometimes, it, it, it is, for us, it's only a bad neighborhood. For them, it's a social connection, social ways. And a lot of the Americans wanted to help. A lot of the neighbors and a lot of the folks wanted to help. And they said, no, we're not going to move. Help us. 
rebuild this neighborhood and then we'll stay we'll stay there so and that neighborhood still operates I'm not a big fan of it um, a lot of people a lot of our social service operators are not big fan of it but I, I think I think it's for us to understand what's what is their um, connection to their own neighborhood and in their own shops and their own businesses and and how close by so I think I agree with you <laughs> I think it's such an important point that segregation is not in itself harmful um, because I think there's sometimes an assumption, particularly in European policy debates, that segregation is itself a problem. And, and sometimes uh, people are referring to neighbourhoods which are themselves quite diverse. It's just that they might have a perception that they are segregated. Um, and I think it's also interesting that you know it's, we have to think about under what conditions a segregated neighbourhood becomes harmful. And I think the answer is something like, when it curtails economic opportunities, when people are, are separated. Doug, could you talk a little bit about what the right policy response is to segregation, if you think there should be one? Segregation or, or um, parallel societies, as, as some, some Europeans call them. Yeah. Um, there's two different things going on, right? There's the segregation of inclusion, which is when, when people have come from another place and they form a community together in order to help each other out. Now, let's not pretend this is a utopian situation where where they're choosing to live wherever they want. Uh, the I should say the second form of segregation is the segregation of relegation. That's where people are forced to live somewhere um, because of who they are, because of their racial or, or cultural uh, background. Um, and uh, sometimes that's because uh, of explicit exclusion, sometimes it's because of subtle rental market exclusion, where, and sometimes it's because of economic factors. Um, but uh, pe people do choose to be near each other. That doesn't mean they live in a neighborhood that's 100% uh, like that. Generally, if a neighborhood is 100% one ethnic group, that's the, that's, that's the segregation of relegation. That's, uh, that's uh, the, the African American neighborhoods of the of, of the twentieth century in the United States were were started out as places where people coming coming from the South had 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 chosen to live as stepping stones on the way to somewhere else, and then they were forced to stay there because of because uh, of racist exclusions in the housing market. You do see that happening as well, where where people start off trying to use living together in, in, the in, in the same neighborhood as a way to start, and then they discover they can't, they can't move anywhere else. But generally these, these what I call arrival city neighborhoods, these, these, uh, these districts where people settle together in order to self-integrate, they're, 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 they're often a very small component of what's going on. I mean, people for years wrote about Tower Hamlets in, in East London as being this like Dhaka Bangladesh. It was the, the big Bangladesh area. Even the most heavily Bangladeshi parts of, of East London are maybe, are maybe 15 to 18 percent uh, Bangladeshi. And that's fairly typical of, of, of these districts in, in European cities. The, it, you know, uh, the infamous, infamous Moroccan districts of this city are maybe 20 percent Moroccan. Um, uh, in in origin and that sort of thing, you do you 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 usually have a whole lot of different things going on. Those districts in Brussels tend to be as much uh, Congolese as they are as they are Moroccan, and so on. You have you have a whole bunch of people making their trajectory in the same districts uh, at 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 the same time, and it helps from a policy perspective to recognize that um, yes, there is racial exclusion in housing markets and in housing policy and in other policies as well. But that manifests itself in specific forms as specific barriers, as a lack of access to housing, as a lack of access to institutions, as a lack of access to education, as built-in barriers in education systems that cause people to want to leave school at a young age and things like that. And it often helps to tackle that problem uh, by talking about specific barriers like this, by creating housing market access, by, by making education systems uh, better able to retain people to full years of completion and that sort of thing. Because it, it, it doesn't help to say to people, you're being racially exclusionary. Uh, that sort of large scale problem is very hard for commu communities and governments to grasp. 
So breaking it down into its actual manifestations in housing markets and so on allows governments and agencies and people to tackle these big cosmic problems of, of exclusion in, in a piecemeal basis, in a point-by-point -point basis. Fred, do you want to take this question or should I go back to the audience? Just one quick yeah, comment great. Uh, I, about what you've uh, said about the media is a very, very important. I remember 2015 when uh, the, the, uh, the TVs, there was a lot of migrants coming to Europe and people were saying there's a big crisis happening and up to some extent it had played its part in Brexit, which we don't want to talk about. Um, so uh, it, 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 I, I want to ask all of you one question, please. Can you estimate the population, the percentage of the population of refugees living in the UK. So if you look at the media, you see these big boats coming and, and it looks like the whole country is overrun. But do you know what percentage actually, if you add the whole, you know, the ones that came, the ones that were born, if you add all of that, it is less than 1%. In fact, it's less than 0.5%. What you're saying is very true. We are not sitting on the other side and influencing media. The media is making all up all these stories, but what we have to do is to tell the people the truth. The refugee crisis that everybody was talking about that happened in 2015, actually it did happen, but it did not happen in England, and mainly actually it did not happen in Europe. The people that fled from Syria went to the neighboring countries, and it does a very important message that we have to be consistently feeding to the media. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Panagiotis Zanetakis. I'm an activist and urbanist and work with civil society organizations in Greece providing housing and approaching uh, housing as a human right. Um, th thank you very much for the contributions. I, I would like to focus on the last aspect of the question of the panel, mainly the aspect of how can we reduce receiving communities' anxieties concerning social change or strange services and resources resulting in some local populations feeling like the sense of home is changing or under threat. Uh, I think in the context of uh, uh, both the North American and the European uh, landscape uh, and the housing market, and observing that there is a major decrease in investment in social housing, uh, as well as uh, a commodification of housing leading to uh, a lack of accessible, affordable or social housing, uh, I want to ask the panel to what extent we should approach this differently. So instead of trying to uh, uh, move towards a model of uh, integration or policy that is aiming to support uh, newcomers uh, into uh, getting into the housing ladder, into the pro property market, to what extent we should approach it from a wider uh, scope and concept of uh, uh, changing the notion around housing as a way of re uh, responding to the housing crisis and the lack of adequate housing, not just for newcomers, but for uh, 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 local communities as well. So to what extent should we change the narrative or the responses and have this be about broader housing responses to this challenge rather than being about migrants and refugees? Uh, yes, and, and, and understanding that the challenges are uh, universal and that uh, we should focus uh, on, the, on the wider. Excellent question. Thank you. Anyone like to go first? Doug, you're moving to your Just mic. very briefly say... As, as I said earlier, we need to recognize that there isn't a refugee housing problem, there's a housing uh, problem. This is true in most economies around the world right now, that there's a housing supply shortage um, in all sectors of housing um, that's, that's driving up prices. Uh, why is there a housing supply shortage? People don't want to build. Uh, people do not want to recognize that they're low population density neighborhoods should become higher population density neighborhoods. Um, I've, in, in, I think I've heard a lot of urban planners say this, and I think it's true, that low population density is the enemy of integration, right? What is worst for the integration of people is living separately from each other. These, uh, these apartment districts in European cities where you have grassy areas or forested areas between buildings, they create, they create barriers to economic inclusion, they create barriers to physical inclusion, they create barriers to creating small businesses, and it's a gendered problem as well, because you find that, that uh, women, particularly from newcomer communities, feel forbidden to go into these dark spaces between buildings and to leave their home, and are unable to connect in, in, in physical ways. So you could say there's a problem of low population density of big empty spaces between the places where people live, and the political self-interested forces that allow these empty spaces to remain. And this is a problem for 
uh, both for integration and for the creation of the density that will allow us to increase the housing supply and to lower the prices of housing uh, around the world. This is, this is something that needs to be confronted not just for refugee and newcomer populations, but for the next generations and for our own generation. Yeah, uh, I'm just thinking if we come and take refugee as we are open and exclusive towards their food, then we could have more solution because the narratives of taking refugee as a crisis, we think like everything was happening in Europe and even in uh, US and UK is because of refugee. No, it's not because of refugee. As Doug said, it's problem of housing. It's not about problem of refugees. So I think we'll come up with more innovative ideas and to think how we can solve this crisis, which is happening due to some economical issues. It's not, not the refugees who are bringing this crisis to Europe or USA. It's already there. So don't blame refugees. Yes, thank you. I think, um, in some sense, we are we are a little bit luckier. We have a little bit of mass land, uh, and housing is definitely affordable. Housing is a challenge for everybody, and not just refugees, as as Doug said. Um, a city called Detroit, Michigan, uh, has absolutely faced a lot of decay in you know in the early 2000s and late 1990s. The not refugees only, but refugees and immigrants have transformed that city into what's happening today. So sometimes in America or in the Canada's context, the refugees go into neighborhoods that are not working very well or have people have moved away from and they, they literally change, they, they build, they they open shops and they create a lot of a lot of business traffic. And unfortunately sometimes what happens is the younger generation will come in and start opening galleries and start opening uh, barista cafe shops and then it becomes a, a, a little bit hard for refugees themselves who actually stabilized the community and made it safer for less drugs and prostitutions and so forth. So um, th there's a gentleman I spoke to in a small town in Ohio called Belfont, Ohio. He told me, he's a business, business owner there, uh, a Honda supplier. He said to me, the city of Belfont has not grown since the Second World War, population decline is a serious thing among Europe and the United States, uh, and refugees are stabilizing those. Uh, the average family of refugees is five point something, you know, when they arrive. That alone, the amount, and they're all younger, so 20 years old, the contribution to Social Security and retirement for the older Americans today is such a plus. So. Those are the kind of data that I use when I'm talking about integration, when I'm talking about what refugees bring into the table. Um, and going back to the media, unfortunately, our media is not very friendly as well to, to, uh, to refugees and to, to immigrants. Uh, but my goal is to actually, when I'm talking to businesses and homeowners, is to address the legality of refugees. Refugees are the only immigrant population in the United States and in Canada um, that has the legal right to work indefinitely, right to school, right to everything, and they have no expiration of their documents. Um, so that alone itself, the employer and homeowner and everything, they realize that these people are not transient, but they're going to be with us for a very long time, and it's an easy sell for, for, uh, for that population. More questions? Okay, thank you, Chair. So my name is Ramzan Shemelov, and I'm making a research on uh, north-south north -south collaboration, effective way of new collaboration. Uh, so let's forget what we're giving for social innovation, for some new ideas, how to resolve the things that we challenge today. And I also would like to come back to the fourth, fourth point of panel one, how to reduce receiving community anxieties. Uh, we know from psychology the trick what if we ask something bigger, we have a chance to get even some small thing. And so as very well mentioned the Anila, uh, today people look at refugees like a crisis, not like a human. And we have to give to society some idea how to resolve 
this crisis globally and uh, remember from which it started. And it started when the war in Iraq on, on false pretext was started and then the refugee flew, the consequences now which we have. And uh, I think, I don't know, I don't know how many percentage of people would like the idea to work together on fighting a root cause of migration. It means improve a situation in the refugees' home country and invite the refugees also to participate on the development processes, stabilization process in their home country. They do, they do the remittance, the money, etc. But I would make an accent on, let's say, the shift on institutional help. Let's say they observe here a lot of good achievement in Europe or in the United States, and everyone have to try to transfer via new technology, Facebook, WhatsApp, and translate it, let's say, on the understandable language for their community, what they observe here in daily life. But for that, they should be encouraged by local authority, by population, by neighbors. So, figuratively, it's when the refugee comes and the social assistants say to him, don't remember your home community, not only sending money, but always trying to transfer a good ideas. For example, in the United States and Canada case, there's a lot of Spanish speakers who are already in very good societal position. And this idea, instead of spending time on looking of primitive movie, to transfer, to transfer some good references via Facebook, WhatsApp, for development of, in the origin country of Spanish speaker, Venezuela, etc., where is the problem? And the same, things here, the French colonies, others, the, the language, there is now difference with the past, what in the internet there is a lot of good materials and it's free. Since we're a little short on time, perhaps you okay, can move into I the question. It was my preposition, let's say, not the question, we talk about social innovation and my way, my understanding on how to act about this globally of course, many people will say it's not our cares or their development, etc. But there is still a percentage of people who cares and maybe operate on that. And then the even social apartment assistance, any social assistance, neighbors, police urgent. If we will try to make this idea popular, at least it can give some outcome. Okay. Thank you. It's a good point that it, this panel has been somewhat lacking in social innovation. The rest of the conference is very social innovation heavy, but perhaps um, after the next gentleman's question, the panelists could maybe comment on um, some innovation issues. Um, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Danny Jakub. I am an architect and uh, urban planner. I'm a uh, Bauhaus graduate and I'm originally from Syria. I've been living for around six years here in, Ger in Germany. So I can speak actually for both sides as an urban planner, an urban researcher, as a refugee myself. I think there's a very key point here when, when a lot of refugees or newcomers, when they came to Europe, they have something in their mind that there are red carpets and flowers and houses waiting for us. Because that's what they see on the television, what they read about, which is sadly not true. When they came here and faced the, the, the reality, how like the, the house shortage here in Europe, it's uh, evidently true, not only for the newcomers, but also for the, for the uh, local people. And then uh, they start to doubt themselves, they start to, to doubt the welcoming culture of the country, which is still there. I had the privilege to work in Germany on a lot greater projects where there was a political will to push integration forward and they were successive 100%. Speaking for myself, speaking for a lot of people that I helped along the process. But uh, it came clear to me that whenever we go to that point when we have to do policies that we can generally implement, then it's the, f the, the, the wrong step. I think the, small, the smaller the scale of the project is, the better the benefit of, of the migrants and the better the, pro the benefit of the project itself. I mean, it's super subjective the value of these small little things that we do for the migrants, I'm trying to speak not as a migrant now, but we cannot just 
put statistics or put numbers and do evaluation, even if it's based on, on, on uh, uh, direct conversation with the migration themselves. It's super difficult. So I would like to know from you uh, to what extent you manage to put small scale projects or large scale projects to be successful projects. Thank you. Great question. Um, we have four minutes left, so I'd like to ask the panelists to give a one minute um, sum up or a response to either of those two questions. I think the point about social innovation and the fact that most initiatives that work well are on a very small scale when we are facing quite a big structural problem um, is a really important one. So, Fuad, perhaps I can ask you, you are a small scale initiative. How do you scale? Or you can take um, either of the points if you'd like to sum up. Uh, Mabel addressed this social innovation uh, question very quickly in the one minute I have. Um, we started as a housing company uh, and we realized that just giving housing wasn't enough. Um, and we are very actively now working in the, uh, 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 in, in the labor integration uh, stage. And we are working with big corporates, uh, your likes of a Starbucks uh, and a lot of organizations in, in, in UK. I believe the work that we're doing, which is seeing refugees as the potential future workforce uh, in, in your cities, is actually a very ineffective way of thinking, rather than just focusing on the charitable and humanitarian way of looking at refugees. Thank you. Thank you. Anila? Yes, uh, I will share, like, uh, uh, board, our board, European Migrant Advisory Board, we conducted a, a survey uh, and focus group discussion with more than 500 refugee and migrant. And uh, the report will gonna launch in 6th of February, and they have some recommendation on integration and ho housing and different themes. So I think this could be a key element to include these refugee and migrant voices into the policy, because it's really important to know exactly about the people who are really living about uh, these areas, because these are missing, these are gray areas. Uh, there's a, a distance and we need to include the, these voices as a meaningful and uh, this could help and I really uh, want uh, when this going to be launched uh, on 6th February and I, uh, I think it's like one of uh, social innovation like we are representing these voices very close to policymakers. Thank you. Um, to address the first question, I think um, the Somali community that I've lived in the United States for, for about 25 years or so is giving back to their homeland where where they came from politically so and I think the UK um, uh, individuals who have integrated who have been in the country for a long time are giving back to the community so to answer the question of what are they doing for sort of not only here not only where they are but what they're doing for their homeland also they're giving back uh, their time and political will to stabilize the country uh, that they came from. Um, to, to talk about the innovation, the things that we've done, um, my area of focus really is about uh, inclusion economically, how, how they could be participating in the economic factor, and, you know, purchasing power and being part of a, a community. It's employment. And employment, one of the biggest factors, as everybody knows, uh, is language. And if you don't understand the language to communicate, whether you're an engineer, whether you're you know, a janitor from, from your home country, it's very hard for you to obtain that same status, same employment. So language acquisition is what we looked at. And, and you know, subsequently, Fuad and I were talking about similarities in programming that we do, is to really dissect and how human beings communicate and talk about exactly what that job uh, is and how many words does that job need to be completed. Now, we're not talking about high-level attorneys and, 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 and doctors, we're talking about, you know, um, sort of that entry-level positions in, in which they can stabilize when they first arrive. And by us communicating, am I, am I going over time? I'm sorry, I, I get, I get oh, very okay. nerdy about, about this and I, and I can <laughs> go on about it, so somebody has to stop me. I, I think bottom line is we focus on the language of the workplace. What does that actually mean in order for you to communicate with your colleagues when you first arrive? both culturally, linguistically, and to be part of a conversation. So, and I think we're gonna go into that later on in the panel. Great, thank you. And Doug, um, so minus one minute for you. Okay, <laughs> look, you raised a crucial point. When you look at the, the, the social enterprises, 
in sort of the refugee space that are doing the most effective stuff and succeeding, they are the ones started and run by refugees themselves. Um, I, I, I was just t t uh, talking with uh, Ahmed Hossein, the, the Canadian immigration minister, who himself is a refugee from Somalia, about what we thought is the best example, uh, examples of, of this stuff. I mean, the most famous case in Canada is the town of Andy Ganesh, Nova Scotia, which was an impoverished uh, uh, town and, 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 and with a lot of unemployment on the East Coast, the last place where normally refugees would want to settle. But one family settled there uh, during the Syrian refugee crisis. They had run a chocolate shop in, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, they started a little factory making, making chocolates to eat. They now employ 200 uh, people. And, and specialize in trying to bring in refugees, and they've turned the place, the town, into a target where refugees ask to be settled, and so on, which is good because it has a big supply of, of cheap and, and, and empty housing. So circling back to how we begun this discussion, um, looking at the question of, of how, do we, how do we get refugees to settle in places where the housing is affordable, I think the answer is to look at the social enterprises, the business enterprises that refugees themselves run, give them the assistance uh, that they need to turn places around. Because again, we want to look at refugees not as, as units of labor competing or so on, we want to look at them as people who are creators of, of economies around themselves. Fantastic, and thank you all of you for being very concise. Um, my takeaway from this session is that uh, the problem of housing is not about housing, it is about early access to jobs, access to entrepreneurship, creating these dynamic clusters of social enterprises and businesses that refugees themselves can contribute to, a sense of dignity. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for listening and participating in what I think was a wonderful panel.